butcher will lead us in the place. Stand, please. Our heads. <coughs> Precious God, we come again as the service of this city to transact business of this city. Lord, as we come, we ask our blessings upon this meeting. We pray, Lord, that our decisions today will be pleasing in thy sight. We pray, Lord, that the meeting will be conducted with peace and order, and that once we finish here, Lord, that we can leave knowing that we have done the best and that what we have done will be beneficial to the citizens of this city. Is in these blessings that we ask. Amen. Amen. To face the flag and repeat after me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Councilman Bradford. Present. Councilman Fuller. Present. Councilman Nicholson. Present. Councilman Butcher. Here. Councilman Flores. Here. Councilman Green. Here. Here. And tomorrow, I entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the administrative conference on May 24th and the meeting on May 28th. Um, does any council member have any awards, recognitions, or distinguished guests at this time? Well, I'd like to council know I came in second on the 5K race, <laughs> right behind Councilman Bradford. Next year, I'm challenging Lord Thompson for a match. <laughs> All right. Any other council member? Seeing none, Mayor Perkins, do you have any awards or distinguished guests uh, at this time, sir? I do not, Chairman. All right. Mr. Green, your proper standards here? Does anyone have anything relative to uh, proper standards? Since we had a, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Mr. Green, since, since the weather seemed to dry up a little bit, are we making any progress? Some of these, uh, yeah, we're, we're cutting all over <laughs> like crazy. So, I, yeah. I didn't send them in, but I mentioned at the previous meeting regarding uh, uh, debris mm -hmm. on a lot of our thoroughfares. Uh, 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 the debris on the thoroughfares, yes, um, you'd have to be a little bit more specific with me, but. <laughs> If you can kind of give me an idea of where you're talking about, I can. Let me let me just let me just uh, email you some, some some streets, right? And some blocks. Okay? That'll work. But I mean, throughout the city, I'm seeing either people are evicting people, putting putting their debris on the side. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing, and I know uh, the, the the order for the knuckle knuckle truck has to be put in. But I'm seeing a lot of that also where the knuckle boom truck needs to be. Uh, Need to be touring the area and getting getting some uh, trash off the, off the streets. But I'll send the Pacific streets that I was referring to. Okay. okay. That'll help me. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Green. Right. Ms. John sent us our Sherry sent out the revenue uh, plan, right? Yep, sent it okay. to Tuesday of last week. All right. And the city attorney as well. Yes, there haven't been any changes, but I can confirm that via email. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Ms. Jones, will there be any legislation added tomorrow? None we're aware of. All right. <coughs> and we have the final request to speak. Mr. Marvin Muhammad. Uh, Marvin Muhammad, 2808, Hersey D. Wilson, uh, to the council administration. Um, I want to thank uh, City Councilman Chair uh, Bowman uh, for a conversation that uh, we had this weekend on the very topic that I want to speak on, which is uh, the public comments ordinance <coughs> that, uh, that the city councilman from, from District C uh, Altered and sponsored to 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 revise and amend. Um, as I said in the article that we was quoted in just this past weekend, I said that this podium is an opportunity for this council to to gauge the pulse of the citizens of the of the city of Shreveport. 
I also said that this uh, governmental body has become very restrictive. I said also that this governmental body has, has why they uh, uh, point fingers at the administration about the lack of transparency, but yet don't want to, to even engage what I would call lawful deliberative dialogue. It's literally our way or no way. That, I believe, when the citizens, and I say this humbly, when the citizens' uh, teardrops get lost in a calamity, a calamity of, 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 a, of a rainstorm, it becomes an issue. It's almost as, as if the, the council believes that the citizens serves them versus that the, that the council is actually representing the people. Um, I was hoping that some council person would be bold enough or courageous enough or brave enough to actually add an amendment to this because and I, and I also want to commend Councilman uh, Green because he sought to, to guide the council a couple of weeks ago about the council being willing to lend an ear about the sensibilities of, of black Americans in Shreveport and it was cast off you know, by another council member. And I, and I can't recall who did it, but they basically said, well, who, who is to say? what is sensible, you know, what, what is sensitive to anyone. And what has, to be, what, what has to be understood is that black people have a very unique experience in America. So we are different. We're going to have sensibilities that is different uh, from the everyday American that, that came in and grew, and, and, and grew, up, and grew up here. It's very vastly different, and and I believe this council has shut its door and its ear and its heart on that. So I won't take up the, the full three minutes, but I'm hoping that uh, in the future that we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John Settle. John Settle for Tealwood. Uh, I just wanted to give some good news. Uh, two weeks ago I was here and I pointed out to uh, Gary Norman that a couple of street signs were down in my district, which is also your district, and I was happy to see this last week they, they got corrected. Uh, it just occurred to me how many thousands of street signs we may have where they're knocked over or in a wreck or something like that. So I don't see, congrats. thank you for following up on that. I see here today, it looks like you're going to have a PowerPoint on food trucks. These are so very ineffective for those of us in the audience, and I wonder how really effective they are for you. Because it's difficult to read them, we're flipping through them, etc. I really think that you ought to change your rules. If, if a government agency or anybody is going to have a PowerPoint, they ought to have some copies to hand out. And this is going to be on the food truck amendments, which came up two weeks ago. We had a member of the administration here giving detailed objections to it. I actually have a copy of everything he had, and I think this is going to be a big waste of time today because I'm, I suspect or hope that this goes to a committee. But PowerPoints, I go to the commission meeting, council meetings. They're flashed up there. I, I wonder how much you all can observe if you don't have the written copy. Audience members, we get lost unless there's handouts there. And I would really urge this food truck amendment to go to a committee. I've reviewed it, the ordinance, as the new amendments, and I've reviewed the comments of Brandon Fail, and they're very complex. And I don't think that it's going to be easy to resolve around uh, this horseshoe. And on the issue of trash on the streets, um, I took a picture on um, Fairfield of what an eviction, and I sent it to many of you, uh, th there's a way, I believe, to handle that, that, that at one committee that Bossier City has a procedure that handles that. Uh, as a landlord, you can evict, put it on the curb, et cetera. 
Uh, I think you could tighten up your ordinance, and part of that would probably be to have an environmental court or property standards court like Monroe has. I've reviewed that ordinance. It appears to be very effective. I was the first chairman of the very first property standards board under Mayor Hanna, and so I became aware then of the challenges. And reality-wise, I think that the legal challenges with property standards ordinance are the same today as they were way back then. Thank you. Mr. Billy Roy Wayne. Billeroy Wayne, 6144 Farrington Court, Shreveport, Louisiana, 71129. For the most part, it is expected that elected officials consider the well-being and the issues of concerns of the persons who elected them to office. Yet there should be times when individual districts should take a back seat to the overall good of the city, parish, state, and well-being. While I have a great deal of respect for the council persons who are in favor of the sagging repeal of the sagging ordinance, I do feel that the repeal of this ordinance, ordinance to whatever degree is a mistake. The subliminal messages sent by such a repeal gives the appearance of a city which values acceptability above accountability. Ordinances, regardless of their nature, should not be held captives to particular situations, emotions, nor current events. The measure of benefits gained by repealing this ordinance may pale in comparison to the overall social, economic, and educational damage which may be done to our young persons. We should consider such when we make our decisions. Thank you. Ms. Judy Williams. Judy Williams, 836 Onionta Street. I'd like to respectfully disagree with the gentleman who just spoke, and I'd like to speak in favor of repealing the saggy pants ordinance. I think it's obvious that this has been overwhelmingly used against young black men, particularly against young black juveniles. I think it's an issue of freedom of expression, which we're all guaranteed in the Constitution. I don't feel like we should be in the place of legislating dress codes. I think there are better uses for our public safety dollars. I wanted you particularly to hear from me as an elderly white woman. So thank you very much. Ms. Daniel Richard. I'm Danielle Richard and I'm at, I live at 296 Atlantic Avenue um, and I'm here to speak about the sagging pants ordinance. I, I definitely am in favor of repealing it. Um, I don't think the law is necessary. If there are certain decency standards that, that we need to stick by, that's one thing, but um, applying fines or um, different things to a certain fad or a certain trend is totally unnecessary. Um, I can see where in the future we may choose to ban yoga pants or ties or any other random piece of clothing. Um, that's really not the place of the city council at all. So I'm very happy to see that this is coming up to be repealed and, and I definitely support that. Mr. Kenneth Kraft. Kenneth Kraft, 157 Archer, 71105. 
In 41 years in Shreveport, this is my first speaking at a work session because I'm off today, and that's interesting. And uh, I was one of two citizens who opposed Saggy Baggy Pants in 07. The other one is deceased. So there are standards. I know y'all wouldn't allow to drop the pants and the shorts and show the private. So there are standards. It's just a matter of what they are. But please repeal it. But I'm really here on number 70 of a resolution. I'm here to talk about baggy, saggy infrastructure. Streets, drainage, roofs at rec centers, fire stations, the convention center, the Linwood overpass is sagging. The Stoner overpass over Lyon Avenue is sagging. So thank you all for moving forward and recommending the 16-member committee, similar to what Mayor Glover did. He was, he was clever. He did it in 2010 as he was running for a second term, and the election wasn't until April 2nd of 11. And as a small suggestion to Casey on the fact sheet, which was well presented, I would have added one statement that the last actual successful bond election was April 2nd of 11. You don't have to say it was $175 million, but we did really well. We did 62% yes on Proposition 1 for water and sewer. Thank you, Consent Decree and Uncle Sam and DOJ. And we did a little less well on parks, police, and fire. But let's consider doing that again as we move forward, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, parks sometimes fails on its own, but it got a 57% yes because it was carried by the public safety departments. Uh, and the third one was streets and drainage back then, and it got a 60% yes. So they all passed, and it will likely pass again. The timing, we've got three months. We've got until September 23rd after the committee meets throughout the city and the neighborhoods. And I trust there will be meetings in most, if not all, districts. And uh, that would be the November 16th runoff, the gubernatorial runoff. There's, there's literally no time for October 12th primary because it's due in four weeks in early July. Or we could fall back to the presidential primary next year on uh, April 4th, the day before Palm Sunday. But I don't like those low turnout elections. I think if we can concentrate on getting it on the November 16th gubernatorial runoff, we can get some money. Uh, I don't know if we would actually appropriate the funds to the 2020 budgets until the bonds are sold. That's something for Sharika to work on with the attorney. But certainly this is a big step. And I just regret that Ordinance 70 gets so much play and Resolution 70 gets so little. Because uh, as I said to Mr. Lester from this podium 12 years ago, someday some council person turning out to be uh, is, is going to repeal that. Thank you. Ms. John Glover. Good evening, Council Persons, Mayor. The last time I stood before you, I came with you with a suggestion, but maybe not a suggestion itself. Ms. Glover, I, we, all, we all know who you are. We okay. can say your name and your address, please. Oh, and I do apologize. Yeah, uh, John Glover, 8100 Pines Road, Apartment 3G, Shreveport, Louisiana. Thank you. I implore you all to remember to whom you represent, not only your districts, but the city as a whole. We have so many things on the table for us to discuss, and those things have to be with all of us into consideration. One issue cannot, cannot bring about a difference so much so that it divides the city. That issue sagging pants. Whether we think we have the right to legislate or not, the ordinance was put into place for a reason. It doesn't matter today why we want to give reason or justification or excuses for such. It was there. And undoubtedly it was there for a reason. Now you're asking or being asked to look at a repeal. Well think about who you are representing across the scale, not black, not white, but all of us. And you do so in every and each issue that is brought before you for your consideration. We got to stop the division and the divisiveness because it renders nothing of worth. And our city is worth saving. 
and division and divisiveness will not save her. Thank you. Mr. Cedric Murphy. And the rest of you guys. Uh, June is um, National Men's Health Awareness Month, and I just wanted to share that information with you guys to uh, talk to your neighborhood associations. And most men have or refuse to go to doctors. So in this month, we're asking all men, black and white, we're asking all men to go to the doctor and get themselves checked. Secondly, June is also Post-Traumatic Stress Syndrome Month. And that is a month that is raising awareness for the causes behind it, the conditions behind it, the things people go through. It's not just a military disease. Okay, I thought I heard something in the background. Um, and last, uh, we are having a memorial for Anthony Charles tomorrow at 9 o'clock at the site where he died. And we're hoping that uh, some of you guys, if you have time, you can stop by. And uh, like I said, I didn't, wasn't prepared to speak today, but uh, basically that's all I want to have to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Mr. Chairman, there are no further requests to speak. All right. Uh, we have the following executive appointments to be considered tomorrow. Assistant City Attorney Courtney Harris, Assistant City Attorney Alonzo P. Jackson, Jr., and Metropolitan Planning Commission Windsor Andrews for a reappointment, and Shreveport Airport Authority, <coughs> Mr. Grant Knuckles. Um, I know, Mayor Perkins, if you had either of those here today that want to speak or that someone need to see? I'll uh, see, see Mr. Andrews. We have one. We have one present. Okay. Anyone Chairman, have any questions or want to see? Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Jackson and Ms. Harris are both here. They are. And available for questions. And Mr. Wednesday Andrews is here right here. Right. Yeah. <coughs> so, yeah, Mr. Chairman, let's have him come in for the body. All right. Mr. Andrews, since you're up front, would you like to to the podium, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to the mayor. Council members, it's indeed an honor to have the opportunity to stand before you this afternoon and on this side of the podium. I wanted to share just a couple of things with you guys. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Windsor Andrews. I was born in a little town called Truck Snow, Louisiana, in Union Parish. I attended Southern University, A&M University of Baton Rouge. Louisiana, which uh, is the largest historically black university system in the world with five campuses. I had to throw that in. I saw Mr. Wayne with his Grambling stuff on. <laughs> I'm an agriculture graduate in the field of animal science. Uh, Mr. Andrews, would you step back a little bit? I'll be glad to. Like I said, this is my first sample on this okay. side. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get it where I can read it. Uh, I received an agriculture degree in the field of animal science. My first full-time job was at a sawmill in South Arkansas with a BS degree. September 1, 1969, I went to work for the Louisiana State University Agricultural Center located at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My graduate school work was done in extension education with an emphasis in landscape architecture and horticulture. My various assignments included youth education with emphasis in leadership and citizenship. County Agricultural Agent for East Carroll, West Carroll, and finally Cattle Parish here in the Shreveport area. Shortly after becoming Cattle Parish County Agent and Office Supervisor out here on East 70th Street, I was promoted to Area Specialist in Community Leadership and Economic Development for Northwest Louisiana. Set in several meetings on discussions of I-69, I-49 and a number of other thoroughfares that are now coming to fruition in uh, Northwest Louisiana. After 38 years and six months with Louisiana State University and the USDA, I became a retired professor. 
Two years later, I always say to the kids, two years later I flunked retirement, but two years later I came out of retirement, went to work for the Department of Public Safety for, uh, by serving four years for the governor on this parole board. Truly an experience. Throughout my career, we have served on numerous boards throughout the city, of the, city the parish, the state, and uh, the country, as was reflected in my resume submitted a few uh, weeks ago. Aside from being a father of four and being married to the beautiful Miss Vivian Andrews, who, by the way, has been featured in the Essence magazine for three different issues, makes me really proud. Um, my greatest accomplishment has been to provide leadership in building a $3.2 million worship center called the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, located at 4670 Lakeshore Drive here in Shreveport, where the Dr. Henry L. Armington is the pastor. Once again, thank you for allowing me to serve the city of Shreveport. Right. Thank you, sir. Councilman Brown. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Ms. Andrews. Let's have a couple questions for you, please. Sir. Senator, thank you for uh, agreeing to be uh, recommended to be appointed to the Metropolitan Planning Commission again. Uh, you read your resume, but I'm familiar with a lot of your work, as you know. But tell me, what do you, you know, we had a mess planning committee meeting the other day uh, in regards to the Metropolitan Planning Commission in the city, in the parish. What do you see our greatest potential? In the master plan? Within, within the MPC relationship with these two bodies, with the body of the commission in the city? I tell you what, <clears throat> I don't want to be too brutally honest, but I've lost a lot of sleep serving in this capacity the last couple of terms, and it's all because my heart's in the city of Shreveport. I've had several opportunities to work in a number of other states and even a couple of foreign countries where I was asked to apply, but I really chose to stay here because I love the city I love the work that I've done with the community. I've never used it to build a resume. Uh, the master plan program that we went through several years ago uh, was an awesome uh, undertaking. We had a number of people throughout the city, for those of you who sat through some of the meetings at the convention center, saw the master plan put into play and the design of it rolled forward. And ultimately, once we got that document to uh, be in place, then we set out to put together the Unified Development Code as it stands today. I said then and I'll say now it's a document that's a work in progress. It's something that's not perfect, but yet there is some opportunities for everyone to, to play a part in helping to make it fit or suit your district wherever you might be. And we've tried really, really hard in our efforts to make it user friendly. And uh, at any point in time where you find that there's something that you feel like your constituents are not very comfortable with, we invite you to sit down with us with our staff and, and offer some input. I know that we extended some terms for those persons who had properties that were uh, taken in a, in a different direction from what the program was designed for. They've had an opportunity to come in, and it takes us but a motion and a second to rectify that situation, uh, just to mention one of the things. But I, I feel very strongly that the new coding system provides an opportunity for all of the districts to have some input, even the five mile out areas where we are, where our um, program extends for an opportunity to help make Shreveport a better place to live. And I appreciate that uh, because sometimes in, <clears throat> lately we've been hearing a lot of uh, remarks regarding Shreveport in a doom and gloom uh, light. You don't share that. I do not. I do not. Uh, I'm doing my best to get my kids to stay here. Uh, there's a couple of them who have strayed away, but uh, I imagine the older I get, the more they want to get close to that inheritance. But having said <laughs> that, uh, I'm very excited about the future of Shreveport. Uh, someone said there's no Superman coming, and I don't know if that's a proper term or not, but I feel like if we can all work together, we can make Shreveport a better place to live. Uh, this interstate commerce that, that passes through here and in the future for I-49 and even I-69, which you and I may never see, but I know that it's going to happen because I've seen the drawings 10 years ago that they're going to happen. We've just got to stay the course and work together to make this happen. In my final remark, and I appreciate that as well, uh, this report, and, and you've been a part of the apparatus that tried to <clears throat> give us some, some vision and direction in, 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 in how we would proceed. 
But I have to remind people, and I hope you can agree, that the, the Shreveport of 10, 20, 30 years ago is gone. I mean, the demographics of Shreveport has changed. Uh, we know statistically, you know, that Shreveport, the majority of Shreveport is, uh, is, is, is on or below the poverty level. And the things that you mentioned, for instance, the uh, commerce, interstate uh, opportunities with 49 and 69, it's what I see as a boostful opportunity to, to move and to create economics, a, a new degree of economics in this city. But, uh, but waiting and wondering when is the report of the 80s and 90s is going to reappear, it's not going to reappear. The, the future report is in the hands of this body, the mayor, Metropolitan Planning Commission, and I think, and I think, like you, that uh, we can work together, we can make, the, make just a brighter future for Shreveport. It's in our hands now, let's do it. I certainly agree with that. We all have to have some skin in the game sure. in order to make it happen. Mr. Andrews, thank you for your remarks. Thank you, sir. Councilman Green. Thank you. Mr. Andrews, I'd just like to say congratulations and, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't plan to say anything, but I know Vivian going to ask you when you get back home, did I say anything? So <laughs> tell her that I congratulate you. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Mr. Mr. Chair, I do hope that everyone understands that there are nine seats on the MPC board. There's four that um, relegate to the city council. There's four that uh, pay attention to the uh, parish commission. And then there's one seat in the middle that's a joint appointment. And that seat would be the one that, that I hold as I stand before you today. So thank you very much for your confidence. Well, thank you, sir, for your willingness to serve and, and uh I have to thank Ms. Ms. Andrews, too, for allowing you to serve, too. So I uh, <laughs> just want to tell you that. Make sure you tell I said I'll that. i okay. glad to. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> City Attorney, who, you have who here? Uh, yes, sir. I have Ms. Courtney Harris and Mr. Alonzo Jackson, Jr. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. Oh. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, let's, Ms. Courtney, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, most certainly. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I am a resident of Shreveport, born and raised. I'm a graduate of the Southern University Law Center, class of 2016. Um, at the Southern University Law Center, I participated in a, a number of events. Um, evening president of the SBA, um, as well as the chairman for the Barristers Ball, um, I was also a joint degree graduate. I have an MPA and Master's of uh, Public Administration received from the Nelson Mandela School of Public Policy. I was the only candidate in my graduating class to receive a joint JD and MPA. Um, returned back to Shreveport where I've been um, just working here and just trying to uh, navigate my way and be a part of the community and help the citizens. All right. Uh, Anyone have any? Have any questions or anything? Ms. Harris, what work have you done since you graduated in 2016? Upon my return back to Shreveport, I was a judicial law clerk for Judge Ramona Emanuel and Judge Correa Stewart. Um, after leaving um, the judicial law clerk position, I went to the public defender's office and I also opened up a private practice um, and I have been doing that successfully. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Councilman Brown? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I was looking at the, uh, uh, the job description or the assignments that the attorney, city attorney was going to offer them. And, I, and uh, I'm asking the question, but at the end, I'll let her give us a description of what they'll be doing in my office. But uh, you say you graduated in 2016 from Southern University Law Center? That's correct. Okay. And, uh, and I apologize. That. So, uh, you haven't been in private practice? No, I, I went into, I opened up my private practice at the same time I left the position of being judicial law clerk. Mm -hmm. At the time that you're a judicial law clerk, you're not allowed to practice law okay. outside of the court. Okay. All right. You feel comfortable coming in with, within the city, city, city attorney's office? Extremely comfortable. Okay. All right. Well, she's going to tell us what you'll be doing, so we'll see how comfortable you have for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank I'm thank you. I'm sure will be fine. All right. That's one fuller. I'm good. Okay. All right. Mr. Jackson. Good afternoon. 
right. Alonzo Jackson, Jr. Uh, I, too, am a lifelong resident of Shreveport. Uh, I was born and raised here. I uh, matriculated through the Kettle Parish school systems, uh, went to Kettle Parish Magnet Schooling, uh, graduated from Huntington High School Law and Business uh, Magnet. Uh, after then, I uh, went to University of Louisiana Monroe. Uh, after that, I uh, went to Southern University Law Center. Um, that's where I graduated from law school. Um, while there, I served as a 3L class president. And since then, I've been working at the Kettle Parish Public Defender's Office uh, upon graduation, uh, where I have a lot of courtroom experience uh, with litigation. And also, I have private practice as well, uh, simultaneously as my time uh, being a contract attorney with the Kettle Parish Public Defender's Office. Uh, no, I, I just, I just, I just need to let you know for transparency. I've been knowing Alonzo Jackson since he was two years old. Correct. <laughs> uh, and I know he'll do a great job. He, uh, his father, the late Alonzo Jackson Sr., was a personal friend of mine who also uh, served the city in various capacities, and uh, he's following his dad's footsteps. Correct. So. Uh, at this time, if there's no questions, Chairman, I'd ask the city attorney to give us a description of what these uh, two young people will be performing at the city. Sure. Uh, starting with Ms. Harris, uh, I plan to have Ms. Harris delegated as the uh, contract contact for the city attorney's office to handle all the yellow sheet contracts. Uh, Ms. Harris, uh, she was being very modest, but she has a, a great attention to detail. I think that um, that that quality of hers will serve as well in reviewing all the city contracts for consistency and making sure they're uh, properly following the law. Um, also, she will also assist us with uh, working with public records requests as a backup. As you guys know, Ms. Sharon Williams is uh, primarily responsible for the public records request. However, that task can be a bit daunting, and so she's going to help to fill in, to fill in some of those, um, those needs, as well as serving as a backup prosecutor at city court. Um, there are currently uh, three <coughs> prosecutors on staff at City Court, but life happens and sometimes we need extra people to have a reprieve. Um, she also helped to uh, support various commissions, uh, the MPC and Zoning Commission. She'll work with the Community Development um, Department. She'll assist economic development, uh, and employee retirement system, and, and any other positions as necessary. As for Mr. Jackson, uh, he will be responsible for fulfilling uh, public records requests that pertain to the police department and the fire department. Uh, those tasks can be a little bit different and they require uh, a different level of uh, attention to detail because you have to review MVS and, and various other audio uh, from law enforcement. As you know, he just stated he was a uh, litigator with the public defender's office and so he's accustomed to reviewing those same documents and videos uh, any whom, anyway, um, so that should not be an issue. Also, he'll be directly supporting the police department and the fire department, um, and I will have him working on some in-house litigation, um, <coughs> specifically subrogations, interventions, uh, collections, things of that nature, uh, to try to reduce some of the costs that we're expending with outside counsel. Um, he'll also help to uh, serve as a uh, backup prosecutor, since he does have that experience. Um, and he'll support, uh, I believe, the SPAR Department Fair Share Program, uh, the library, and the fire department retirement system, and any other needs that uh, may come about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very Councilwoman Fuller. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is kind of awesome. This, make, this makes me excited because quite often, at the same time, we're having people say that we want our kids to stay in Shreveport, we want to see more opportunities for young people to be involved and to have, a, have skin in the game and to show ownership and their willingness to lead and be a part of the city. And some of the same people will be the first ones to say, well, they're too young. <laughs> well, I feel like you've done a good job of picking people whose resumes are appropriate to what you're going to be asking them to do, in particular with you having a master's in public policy on top of your law degree. That's very exciting for me to hear. And thank you for both being willing to, to work in public, in, in the public process of servants, instead of going off to be in a private firm or what have you. I, I just appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. For the record, I also have my master's in public administration. So both of you are in the I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, I graduated in 2014. All right, Mayor Culpa. That's, but it's, it's just good to see people that actually 
have a brain for policy and want to be a part of the process. So thank you. Thank you. All right, I think that's it. But I, I just just add on to what uh, Ms. Fuller just said. I, I, I appreciate you all uh, wanting to stay here and, and, and <coughs> donate to your city. So thank you. Okay. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Right. <laughs> there are no items on the consent agenda to be adopted, am I right? I don't see any. All right, so Ms. Jones, please proceed with regular agenda legis legislation. Resolution 67 authorizing the mayor to enter into a donation agreement with Caddo Parish Fire District number three for 10 used Scott safety air packs. Resolution 68 amending the fee schedule for the Emergency Medical Services Division of the Shreveport Fire Department. Resolution 69 declaring certain city of Shreveport, Louisiana supplies and materials and equipment specifically vehicles to be surplus and authorized with the purchasing agent or her designee to sell and dispose of said surplus property by public auction. Resolution 70, establishing a citizen's bond study committee to study the needs and priorities of the city for capital <coughs> improvement projects. Resolution 71, a resolution to thank Chief Patricia Dias for 37 years and nine months of service to the citizens of Shreveport as a member of the Shreveport Fire Department for her leadership in the department or for being a role, a model for young people, especially women and African Americans. Resolution 72, a resolution to support a submission of bids to the Red River Waterway Commission for funding to renovate and improve Shreveport Downtown Airport. Council Butcher. Uh, resolution 68, uh, in reference to the emergency medical services, um, uh, fee schedule. I think there were some emails that were floating around amongst councilmen. I'd like for uh, Chief Wolver to kind of come up and explain to everybody what's going on uh, with this. And I, for one, believe it's probably way overdue that we, we look at this, and, and I appreciate him proposing it. Chief. Sure. Thank you. Basically, there are two pieces of legislation to the resolution. One is uh, uh, the treatment, no transport. Uh, charges. Uh, those are many times we make a lot of calls where uh, we don't transport the patient or the patient reviews his transport, uh, but they do fall within a transport criteria. The ordinance way it's written right now uh, does not allow us to uh, bill for that transport. And I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, <clears throat> we respond to a, a patient have a diabetic emergency. We arrive on scene. Uh, we start assessing that patient, start an IV, start administering uh, IV fluids, uh, do uh, uh, glucose checks, things like that. Patient begins to come around, uh, they refuse transport. Uh, we call the doctor, ask for permission to disconnect the IV, and because of those, there's no transport, uh, all of that equipment that was used, the response set, uh, the cost of the response and everything, none of that can be billed. So that is, that is for years, um, uh, an expense to the city that's never been able to be recouped on those kinds of calls. The second part of the legislation is bringing us in line with the, what are the EMS transport rates in our region and uh, in, in our local district. We're actually coming in line with what our sister city is um, charging for uh, transports across the river. Uh, and this is just bringing us up to where we should normally be anyway on, uh, on our billable transports. So that is the two pieces of legislation. And we have the comparison rates. I think I sent uh, some of you some of those rates. I don't know if everyone's seen them, but I'll be glad to send those comparison rates to anyone who, uh, who needs them or you can pass them along. I think that, uh, that one thing that might be said that uh as an example, Chief, is, is a medical code that might be worked somewhere out uh, in the field. And now, in the old days, once you started a medical code, you transported them. But now, the doctor can discontinue that at a nursing home facility or at a home. You can, you can accumulate a lot of cost in drugs and things like that. You can push several rounds of drugs. So I'm glad to see us kind of coming along uh, from, from what I've read study-wise, a lot of uh, larger cities like Dallas and have already started doing this. And 
I want to commend the mayor and the administration because we, we task him with, uh, with finding ways to, I don't necessarily call this a budget cut, however it is something that has, has flown under the radar for quite some time that, that is affecting our budget. So I, I appreciate y'all working with the mayor and, and presenting this to us. I think it's, a, it's, it's long overdue. Yes, sir. I appreciate the Public Safety Committee uh, working with us along with also. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Councilman Bradford. Nothing for the Chief. This gentleman, we're going to speak on uh, Motion 72. Thank okay. you. Oh, thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman, uh, in consultation with Councilman Floyd, we're going we're gonna to ask that this be removed tomorrow. Uh, we, we spoke with the city attorney and our clerk, and uh, the language that we was proposing we didn't think was uh, the language that we wanted to put in resolution. The opportunity from the River Waterway Commission to help us with the downtown airport site is still on the table, but we want to be clear uh, with the public as well as with ourselves, the council, uh, that we have appropriate uh, language that will be uh, very uh, appealing to the commission as well as to the condition uh, that we'll be seeking these funds for. So uh, we, we was working on it over the weekend, but we didn't get, we didn't get a document that we could uh, present today. So we're going we're gonna to pull it and then we'll reintroduce it at our next work session. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Ms. Jones, you proceed with introduction of resolution. Resolution 73, authorizing the submission of the 2019 to 2023 Consolidated Strategy Plan and the 2019 Annual Action Plan to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Resolution 74 is authorizing the mayor to execute an acceptance of active donation between the city of Shreveport and the Shreveport Development Corp Corporation, here and after called owner, and acting herein through Anthony J. Janica, for the water and sanitary sewer mains and related facilities to serve Marginee Woods Unit 2 and 12 Oaks. All right. No discussion there. Ms. Jones, proceed with introduction of ordinance. Ordinance 72, amending the 2019 capital improvements budget. Ordinance 73 is amending the 2019 capital improvements budget for Sportran. Ordinance 74 is amending the 2000 budget funding contractual services provided by sports ran by Metro Management Associations. All right, seeing no discussion there as well. Proceed with ordinance on second read and final passage, please. Ordinance 58 is rescinding ordinances 33 of 2009, 54 of 2011, and 136 of 2013, and removing vehicular flow restrictions on Baker Street, Bannon Street, and North Street in Section 37. Ordinance 65 is amending the 2019 capital improvements budget. Ordinance 66 is amending various articles and sections of the City of Shreveport, Louisiana Unified Development Code. Ordinance 67 is to revise Chapter 2, Article 8, Division 2 of Section 2-421 of the City of Shreveport, Louisiana Code of Ordinances relative to on-site certification visits for fair share program participants. Ordinance 68 is amending, amending Article 4 of the Code of Ordinances concerning fireworks. Ordinance 69 is amending Section 90-306 of the Code of Ordinances relative to reserved parking spaces for the handicapped. Ordinance 70 is amending Chapter 50 of the Code of Ordinances by repealing Section 50-167 relative to wearing pants below the waist in public. Ordinance 71 is amending and reenacting certain sections of Chapter 94 of the Code of Ordinances of City of Shreveport, Louisiana, relative to utilities. All right. I have Council Vice Chair Nicholson um, speaking on, would you be speaking about the handicap parking? Yeah, I'm going to ask the administration a question about Ordinance 67. Okay. Is the part on the parking deal, I just want to ask that real yes, quick. Sir. Is that on the, that, that'll be going from... Is it 250, 275 to 500? Uh, okay, that's, yes, I just want to make sure I have my numbers right. Okay. And, and, and since the chairman has asked a question regarding that ordinance, I will again thank Cedric Murphy for calling to the council's attention a need to increase the fine uh, for the abuse of <laughs> handicapped parking spaces. You know, some, some traffic infractions uh, are easy to commit 
accidentally. We all go a little bit faster than we should sometimes on the highways, for example. But there really is no excuse for using a handicapped parking space if you're not handicapped and you don't have authorization to do so. Uh, so I hope that this increase in the fine for abusing handicapped parking spaces will discourage that behavior. Uh, concerning Ordinance 67, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to ask the administration to, uh, well, let me first say that I understand that Section 2421 of the Code of Ordinances requires on-site visits uh, to ensure that companies, businesses applying for participation in the fair share program are, in fact, eligible. Uh, the, the existing ordinance already allows the city to dispense with this on-site visit uh, if uh, another agency provides an appropriate certification uh, or if the city has previously conducted an on-site visit uh, and is renewing uh, the business's fair share uh, uh, eligibility. Uh, as I appreciate Ordinance 67, it would take away the requirement of a mandatory visit uh, to certify a fair share of business. It, it's not clear to me why that's a good idea, but I, I welcome the administration's input, Ms. Jones or, or Mayor Perkins. Sure, and um, uh, Quinn, who um, is our director of, of fair share, I'll have him to come up to provide details. Um, but this is to get us in line with the administrative practice um, that site visits have not always been well, well, done. Well, let me, I, I, I appreciate that, Ms. Jones. I did notice in the fact sheet for this ordinance that uh, there was reference to administrative practices that are not in line with the ordinance's requirements, which I understand to mean that despite the fact that we have an ordinance on the books requiring on-site visits, those are not happening in connection with fair share certification. Is that right? And, you know, well, and with this new administration, our fair share coordinators coordinator has been looking at um, this ordinance and um, the fair share rules very closely um, and of course we'll be coming back to you all with a larger uh, kind of review to make sure that the ordinance is in line with you know the current administration's goals um, but do you have any is there I don't know if Quinn has anything in particular that he wants to add I, I just I would like to hear an explanation for why uh, it is to the city's benefit or or it will help us ensure that the fair share program achieves its purposes to eliminate the requirement of an on-site visit. I, I just don't understand. Sure. That's a yeah. good idea. Okay. We'll get something to you um, more specific um, so that you can have that information. Okay. Well, well I, I mean, I would like it before we vote on the ordinance tomorrow. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, definitely before then. That's it. Okay. Yeah, if there's no response for now, that's it. Thank you. Uh, would you like to see Mr. Well, Mr. Eubanks yeah, I mean, be able if, to speak to him if, after if the meeting if, then? If that's uh, well, I'm, I'm happy to hear from him now if he's willing and has an answer to my question. And if, if he doesn't, then, then he can take time to develop one and provide it to me. Yeah, he can get with you after the meeting. And if there's any follow-up, again, you know, we'll make sure that your questions are answered before you have to vote for, on tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Bradford. I want to speak on 67 as well, but before I do that, I want to ask the attorney a question regarding 70. And I know we've we've heard uh, three meetings of commentary regarding uh, 70. I uh, I'm considering, and I want the council to think about it as well. It is not to deter any other public commentary, but I was uh, wondering what would the charter, not the charter, but the council rules uh, say regarding amend, I mean, of uh, suspending the rules and voting on 70 early in the meeting so that uh, the, uh, the public would know our position on that ordinance prior, prior to um, prior to additional public commentary so that may satisfy some people, but I think uh, that that's something that I mean, that I'm considering. Again, it's on the agenda, so it does not uh, uh, prevent anybody from speaking anyway. So, yeah. 
Uh, I don't foresee any issue, and I confirmed with Mr. Thompson, but we, the council would have to vote on it just like to as suspend would, the rules. To suspend the rules okay. and Mr. Chairman, have to have the appropriate quorum. Th this is after the uh, everybody public has been able to speak. Yeah, after the public can't do full. Well, my, my intention was before. <laughs> you can't after. do it before. Been been I don't, if it's on the agenda, I would think that state law would require us to allow them to speak. No, no, I, I think they're going to speak anyway. I mean, even even on items that are already suspended and adopted, we, that's, that's been the customary procedure. So let me make sure I understand the first question correctly. The question is, can you suspend the rules on that particular item prior to hearing the public comment? Yes. I believe you can suspend the rules to hear it sooner than it appears on the agenda, yes. but I don't believe you can do it prior to the public comments because it is an item on the agenda. Is that, is that your appreciation? Okay. Okay. That's fine. Now, in regards to um, 67, <clears throat> there was an article in yesterday's paper. I don't know if you saw it. My struggle for the last... 18 years in, the, in this, this, this ordinance. The fair share ordinance has been on the books for 19 years. In, in the paper yesterday was some minority contractors, black contractors as well, who said that the fair share program is not working. The mayor has made great strides in the first six months of his administration to increase minority participation in city contracts and procurements. But that's, that's, that's on just a couple of decisions, executive orders that he's made. But the problem is that the fair share ordinance and program has not yielded the type of results that it was intended when it was adopted 18 years ago. Minority and black contractors are only receiving modest and poor procurements and contracts. I feel that in speaking with the administration that, that, that removing, removing our necessary obstacles and, and, and hoops and would, would be a beneficial to us increasing the, the opportunity in sending a message that we're not going to be investigating everything that that's out there to be investigated because the the results of the contract in which they incur would be proof enough. Either they can either they have the equipment, they have the apparatus, they have the resources to do the job. That's what would make them accountable. That's what would make them accountable. Uh, we are at a point now within this city fair share uh, program in how procurements and contracts are awarded that a lot of minorities, and we met with a couple last week, they feel like it's not even worth the try. It's not even, any, it, you know, they have become so dis, so dis, disgruntled and so disappointed in the way they feel we can engage them in city contracts that they feel like What's the use of even trying? It, because there's too many hoops to jump. I'm not saying a free lunch. I'm not saying that we should be looking at unqualified, uncompetent people to do work. But I just think we need to remove obstacles that has hindered the progress in increasing the the numbers in which we are dealing with. Four, five, six percent. It's not good enough. And then we talk about the city, which would trickle into the city's economic mainstream. Which is which? We have a seventeen billion dollar economy, Shreveport. But when you look at African American businesses and construction companies and other uh, uh, opportunities that are afforded to citizens of Shreveport, business wise, there's only one point two percent of a seventeen billion dollar economy that's going toward that that sector of the city. We will not, I keep saying, we will not become a viable city, a progressive city, a city that addresses all of its citizens if we do not work over the next three years, gentlemen and ladies, to do everything we can 
to ensure that the six percent of this city who lives in poverty, who feel hopeless in regards to doing business within the city, within the city government as well as the city business uh, networks, can't do business. You know, I mean, we are, we are being blamed for a city that we did not create. Everything that we, we've been hearing on social media as well as our personal conversations is, 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 is that the condition of the city is just dire. It's just, it's just gloom and doom. And you've only been on the council for six months, going on six months. I've been on the council for four years and six months. The mayor's been mayor for six months, and yet it appears that all the all the blame is being put on this body. And I'm just saying that we 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 have a challenge. I can't tell you, but I, how many times I presented legislation in my first four years of this council that was defeated along racial lines. Legislation that I felt would have been beneficial to, to, to making opportunities better for African American businesses and contractors. We can no longer keep our head in the sand and think that one sector of our city can make the city grow. We, we got to make some hard decisions in regards to not why we can't, but we got to make decisions on how we can, how we can make things better, how we can be inclusive for all of our people. That's important, Mayor. That's important, and and and, and um, the state appears is ready to help us move forward in some areas. And I think we're going to have to make ourselves more anxious in moving forward within ourselves. So the ordinance wasn't intended to do anything other than to remove <coughs> obstacles and, and, and to remove barriers that, that, that hindered some opportunities for people that they say, listen, you know, the proof is going to be in the contract and how they can do the job at the end of the day, the job that they're contracting will be done. And we don't have to go out and inspect do they have enough lawn mowers to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Councilman Bradford, I got Councilman Butcher up, but I want to ask the administration real quickly that if it's okay, I would like to uh, call Mr. Eubanks up at, later on so he can answer uh, a question or two from Councilman uh, Nicholson, if that's okay. I might have questions for him too, okay. so I'll, I'll yield. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm, I want to speak on uh, ordinance number 66. Um, myself and the uh, clerk, uh, Mr. Thompson, and Brandon Fell, and uh, Mr. Clark all had a very productive meeting the other day in reference to, uh, to the food truck ordinance portion of this. Um, I'm going to let the clerk kind of explain what, what I think, and I think uh, Reverend Green has some legislation. Well, he, I gave him mine, so I'm whatever he explained, I'm with. So you. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Thompson kind of explain. The uh, <clears throat> the objection, as I understand it, from Mr. Phil was to the uh, food truck and trail of vendors section of this uh, of Ordinance 66, and uh, one of the things that he objected to was. Uh, having the food truck vendor uh, providing the the MPC with the location where the all of the locations where the food truck will operate and so we came up with an amendment to remove that section that whole section concerning uh, food trucks from this ordinance and sending it back to the MPC uh, with certain instructions, and one of those was to try to come up with an alternative to this uh, part of the of the ordinance. Uh, as I understand it, Mr. Phil was uh, 
uh, did not object to this and uh, consents to the rest of the ordinance being adopted uh, after this section has been removed by the amendment and sent back to the MPC. So basically we're removing that section where they have to report their locations to the Metropolitan Planning Commission. We're removing that in this amendment and sending that portion only back to the MPC. Correct? Yes, it's, it's everything in section uh, D. Okay. Um, in exhibit D. Uh, everything in that section goes back to them. We couldn't do it piecemeal. Right. We couldn't pull out this or that. We had to send the whole thing back because of the way the UDC is constructed. The city council does not have the authority to really amend the ordinance. It can send the ordinance back, and because this was in several sections, it can send this section back to them and ask them to consider certain things, and that's what this does. And then we expect that it will come back to us and the council will have a chance to uh, address it again at a later date. The other portions of the ordinance, though, will be voted on tomorrow, correct? They can be voted on tomorrow. Okay. And if, I if, if this amendment is adopted, then it will be removed and the rest of the ordinance can be adopted with that amendment removing it, removing Section D. Right. And I appreciate uh, the mayor's office and Ms. Krill looking into this for us. She's been very helpful with it. Um, Mr. Clark, do you have anything you want to add about this? It's good to put time for the PowerPoint. Huh? He put together a PowerPoint for us, though. Oh, he does have a PowerPoint. Nobody has any objections. Uh, let's, let's see it. Mr. Butcher, that's what I was going to ask the council to do. We've, we've done extensive research in, in food truck and food trailer. Uh, operations and so forth and we thought that you wanted additional information concerning uh, to assist you in, in reviewing this ordinance and even reviewing the ordinance amendment that is being proposed that might uh, change your mind or might increase your your knowledge if you will of uh, the things that we've been doing we've been working with food truck uh, and food truck vendors for for five to six years and I, I even got additional information this morning from Chief Wolterton that uh, they are required to uh, to uh, go to each location where food trucks are located for fire code uh, fire code review to make sure that they're in compliance with the fire fire codes and so forth. So we just wanted to do a short presentation, if we may, to provide you with this information. So it's so strictly up to you. So, Mr. Clark, this is new information. So, each location, the farm, and he's here. He and he and he shared with me that he would be happy to come up and share that information with you also. Chief, do you mind explaining that to us? And then, if, if nobody has any objections, I'd like to see the, the PowerPoint. And when the PowerPoint is done, I, I'm going to uh, ask uh, and um, reach out to uh, Adam Bailey uh, to bring that information to you. He's done the research for me. Okay, perfect, thank you. Chairman yeah. Bowman, it would now be an okay time for me to say that Ms. Swain has coupons for ice cream, which is a food <laughs> truck that's gonna be outside at 4.30. Also, go ahead, Chief. Uh, Chief, at the, you at the last that meeting. Food truck outside, I'll read <laughs> it's an ice cream truck. It's an ice cream truck. Have yes, you checked it out? And, and, I'll, and I'll, um, I'm more than happy to patronize them and, and take advantage of their business. Uh, uh, from the last meeting, it, it kind of, uh, some of the conversation stirred me because I knew that uh, we'd had food truck vendors before that uh, that were inspected and, and uh, especially around the, uh, that was used out at the uh, Mudbugs uh, at the uh, uh, Hearst Coliseum. So I went and asked our Chief of Fire Prevention, what does the code actually say? Well, the code has actually changed and they are actually held almost to the same standard as a brick and mortar restaurant uh, as, re as requirements for fire suppression systems. Um, they can't be so, they, that be a, a certain distance away from any building. So uh, in my conversation with Mr. Clark this morning was, hey, I, I'm gonna send you this and, and I can send y'all a copy also. You know, these are things that we're responsible for as a fire prevention bureau to ensure that they're operating in a safe manner uh, as it relates to fire safety. And those 
businesses that they set up around. Uh, so it was a concern for me to make sure that I did my research and checked, and, and it is coming out. There's a code coming out that will be enforced um, um, that applies to these food trucks. So, so Chief, you're saying that any building, so if, if they pull up out here in front of Government Plaza, they're supposed to have the fire marshal come? And no, I'm saying there's code that applies to them. They can't. They have to be so many feet from the building. Okay. They have to have certain um, fire suppression um, uh, mechanisms in place, mechanisms right. in, place in, in their food truck. So it's not like they have to call. You have to send an inspector out. It's it's just they have to follow those guidelines. They it actually could be yes, done yes. possibly by yes. signature on what, the original. What concerns me is uh, if they're able to move around and there's no way of monitoring that it, it would just be happenstance with an inspector out that's going to do their normal inspections they okay i'm gonna stop here and do a spot check uh, so that that'd be kind of where that lands at so i just wanted the council to know that there are fire prevention codes that apply to these food trucks just the same as it is to restaurants i want you to be aware of that this is Have a that state knowledge. statute correct this is uh nfpa life safety code one okay mr chairman uh, which I is follow, adopted by this council yeah could i follow okay. up on that the way that it's written now the the proposed ordinance is that every time they move they have to notify the mpc if that ordinance goes into effect and you know where they're moving to will you send an inspector out each time they move to uh view it no sir we wouldn't have to send one out each time they move but based off all other businesses in the city, uh, by ordinance, we're supposed to inspect each business uh, annually. You would inspect them and and make sure that they knew what the regulations were and that they had the proper equipment. And they're abiding by them. And that they're abiding by them, but yes, you wouldn't go out and make a site visit every time they moved? No, sir. Okay. And the only, the only reason there'd be a follow-up visit would be if that initial visit there was if they weren't in line then there would be a follow-up 30 days later okay okay chief thank you well mr clark if you're but like i said if you're ready we would like just to present some additional information to you uh and like i said earlier in the event that additional inspections would be necessary uh, we have the framework to do those additional inspections and we would send inspectors out to advise fire prevention of any violations that may be occurring to, in the uh, fire code. If you would, I'll ask you to listen to Mr. Bailey. Thank you, council members. In an effort to address the various community concerns over the antiquated regulations guiding food truck operations, these proposed amendments have been prepared and recommended to replace the UDC's existing regulations. Uh, current regulations do not adequate, adequately regulate the city's food truck vendors. Thus, the proposed amendments are based on contemporary industry standards and operations and is informed by rules and regulations used in other municipalities throughout the U.S. Picking up where Mayor Perkins last commented on this topic on May 28th, a review of ordinances from several municipalities revealed that the proposed ordinance contains accepted and appropriate provisions for adequately regulating food trucks in the city of Shreveport. Cities such as Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Memphis, Little Rock, and even Tyler, Texas have common requirements that regulate food truck vendors. Uh, some of those common regulations are health permit requirements, fire inspections, commissary requirements, rules for operating in the public right-of-way, hours of operation, distance to uh, restaurants, as well as zoning requirements. For years, ambiguous zoning policies for food trucks have created a need for standard, standardizing their operations. Since food truck regulations uh, were first introduced to the city of Shreveport at around 2012, the Shreveport Police Department has issued zero citations uh, for any type, whether it be a city violation or even an NPC violation. Two weeks ago, uh, it was mentioned that these proposed amendments uh, would create a black market for food truck 
vendors? Well, in actuality, a black market already exists. According to the city's revenue division, only seven food trucks are registered for the city uh, for 2019. And if you do a simple Google search, you'll find that over 30 food trucks operate in some capacity uh, within the city. So uh, a black market already exists. With the passage of these proposed amendments regarding food trucks, the MPC the NPC feels that all aspects of the food truck industry operate uh, will be significantly improved. Features of these food truck amendments include an update to the current code's ambiguous language, the need to modify key terms. Uh, it will address food safety issues. It will establish a proper permitting and licensing process. Uh, it will establish area, proper areas of operation and update the proper operational requirements based on contemporary industry standards and operations. The proposed amendments stipulate that food trucks must comply with the UDC's zoning rules with standardization in the form of operational requirements. These amendments provide uniform and the definitive guidelines. The food truck vendors will have certainty for how and where their business operates uh, through an annual license and temporary use permit. Uh, the temporary use permit will establish food truck vendors with legitimate and structured regulations necessary for proper and consistent operations. As these businesses, as been stated time and time again, contribute to the local economy and become productive and innovative members of the Shreveport food industry, as well as to ensure that the public health and safety is a common concern. Do you have any questions? Let me, let me be clear. You said that on record there's only seven food trucks that Correct. have been registered? Correct. So how are we regulating this as, as of now? Uh, they are not. They're not being regulated? They are not. Okay. This, this, so, uh, so. Oh, let me step back. Mr. Mayor. Does the, um, is the amend, is, are the amendments that we're trying to put forth, the refinement of our rules right now, it's, is there a plan to enforce after? Well, I'm uh, trying to figure well, out. One of the best ways to, the, the MPC feels that they can do that is because currently right now, the, you're required to have a health code or uh, health permit. Mm -hmm. In order, when you get your health permit, then you can go get your city license, uh, true food truck vendor license. We're asking that you get a temporary use permit, so therefore we can verify both of those. Yeah. Because in order to get your temporary use permit, you have to have those too. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering, because I've gone to city events where there is more than seven food trucks in they're, the parking lot. Uh, well, they're and, exempt. Yeah. It, it states yeah. in the ordinance that if it's a city event or on city property. No, 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 not a city event. These I've been to events within the city. Oh. In well, then the parking lots where there were more than seven food trucks in the parking lot. So correct. I'm That's what I'm saying is that there are food trucks operating out there that aren't licensed. Yes. No, I, no I, we're on the same page there. My, my question is simply if I can go into an event next weekend and see eight food trucks, like it seems that we have been doing zero enforcement of like getting food trucks to simply register. Yes. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, I mean, the conversation is, is – no, right, if we don't actually have any kind of enforcement mechanisms and we haven't been doing so since 2012. So I'm trying to figure out what are the enforcement mechanisms that we have in place. Well, there, again, you're, there, there isn't one. There, there aren't any. Okay. There, there's the land use side and then there's the city regulation side. From okay. a, you know, uh, Mr. Clark can address the ones from, uh, for zoning violations, but from a city enforcement, um, there hasn't been. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay. Uh, in, in the meeting we had with Mr. Fell and uh, Mr. Clark, we discussed possibly some type of fines. Uh, like if you get one warning if you're not registered properly, second warning, third warning. So I think that if we do some, if we send this back to the MPC, I think some verbiage will be put in there, or at least that's the what I took from the meeting, that there will be a specific fine if you're caught violating this ordinance. So I, I think that's what we're working towards. Okay, good. Yeah, just some kind of accountability metric because that's, yeah, this, that slide blows my mind. Right now what happens is it goes, they're issued a citation, it goes to city court, and there's no telling how long it'll take to get it on the docket. If we've given out zero citations. Well, that's what the way, it's the way it's supposed to work is it's yeah. supposed to go to city court, right? I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what, the, the way that if we send it back in the Section D, I think what, what the goal would be is to have a defined 
set of fines if you're not following the ordinance. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if they get the special use permit, I the think rates. the the MPC would be responsible for uh, the violations. Correct. And, well, and, all of and, that. and the temporary use permit would follow the property owner, not the food truck. Because the city regulation, the, the food truck vendor license would follow the food truck. So that type of violation would have to come through a citation to the city. If through a temporary use permit, if they were operating on a property and they were in violation, the violation wouldn't be through the food truck, the violation would be through the property owner. Right. All right. Council Woman Fuller. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Bailey. Um, I, I appreciate that you've listed that there are several cities in our general area that are regulating um, their food trucks, but I think a lot of people don't understand why the land use department or the planning department, which covers land use, wants to regulate on top of the food safety regulations. So could you just speak to that and use your cheap words? <laughs> Do you want me to do that or Mr. Clark? Either of you. I think Mr. Clark would be more comfortable. I, I, okay, I appreciate it. I just think people need to understand why you feel like we need this extra layer. As, as you're well aware, uh, the MPC is in charge of land use regulations for the MPC limits. Uh, and we are the only body, the only entity that's responsible for land use. Uh, and that's why when you remove our ability to regulate land use, you basically remove our authority that was granted to us by the legislature. Uh, the reason that we are so concerned is that every time something sets up on a piece of land, it should be in compliance with those land district requirements. And uh, what you've heard earlier in this process with food trucks is that uh, they have not uh, responded to uh, those requirements, and we're only trying to work with them, educate through education and responsibility to set them in a position where they are legal and they're doing the things that are required by land use policy. So some people would argue that just because you're adding an extra layer of bureaucracy in order to bring people in so that some of so that some authority is on is is working with them that you're just adding another hoop to jump through and that we really don't and that's why we did all of this all of the uh, research that we did uh, we're not trying to be obstructionist by no stretch of the imagination we're just trying to assist uh, these entities uh, and in becoming legal becoming an operational in accordance with the laws that you have enacted uh, as the city council here in the city of Shreveport. I'm going to pull at you a little bit more. So can you give an example of in another one of the cities that you've researched how their land use department is regulating compared to what we're trying to do? And, and, and I've talked to Adam one of the things I've done is like you've alluded to I've tried to let young people get involved in the overall operation. They do the, the research and report back to me. Uh, he has actually lived in Austin and could give you a much better example than I have. I think that a, a visual example would be helpful to people. Okay. Like, or just like something we can see in our mind's eye. You know, can you tell us about like the research that you've done, how cities, land use departments, planning departments have been a part of their regulations. A lot of the says. similar language that we're proposing right now but came just from Tyler. Give one example, like Tyler, feet. Tyler, Texas. Yeah. Okay. So, which piece of what we're doing is the same thing? They're required to um, let their. You know, if you want to operate food truck, uh, you, you have, have to, to let them know wherever you every go. time you move. Yes. And see, we're not. I mean, with this temporary use permit. You would apply for the temporary use permit. Let's say at the time that you apply, you know five places that you, you want to go. That You put that on, on the permit. Well, two of those drop off because it's not successful and you want to add five more. Then you just come add those five more and then we review it internally so we can make sure that where you're wanting to go fits within the... So you, you can call and add that, but you don't get to automatically just go to there immediately? 
Well, we would uh, prefer that you called and add it. But you get to go ahead immediately to go to that spot. Yes. Okay. For the most part. Is that what, I mean, that's Tyler's smaller than us. They, people might say they've got more people, well, they, they have more time on their hands. T Tyler wants you to have a temporary use permit for everywhere they go, not just one a separate. Temporary. Correct. Okay. So in Tyler, you have to have individual permits for each place you go. Yes. Temporary uses. And you're just saying we'll add it all to one. Yes. What about like Austin or Portland? I um, am 100% not sure okay. I can get that information and give it to you tomorrow if you'd okay. like. Uh, but but are there any other cities other than Tyler you can think of that have a similar? Um, I I, I want to not off the top of my head. I'd okay. have to. All right. Thank I you. That's helpful. Misspoke. I appreciate yes. it. All right, Councilman Green. Yes, sir. Uh, my question would be this. Is say for an instance, uh, you all say there, how many food trucks operating now? Legally or illegally? Either way. Um, uh, let's say 30. So how many that's operating illegally? That uh, would be around 20, 30, 25. So how do y'all know that? Um, well, I know that seven are operating legally and I did a Google search today and wrote down the list of all the ones like whether it be through Facebook whether it be through Google whether it be through an event whether it be through you know something and I wrote down 32 names so the ones that's mm -hmm. illegal have you all given them notification that these are the things that we need to do. We, we don't have the authority to do that to a food truck the city would okay. have to do that so have you all had a press conference to say if you're going to operate a food truck then there are guidelines that you need to do? Um, a, a press conference, no, sir. A, have we done any notification as to, okay, everybody in the city who has a food truck, then these are guidelines? Say for an instance, may I finish? I hadn't said a word, sir. Okay. Well, you put your hands up, so. That was just a gesture. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I understand. I'm, I thought I was in church. But anyway. <laughs> Say for an instance, if you if I'm not here today and I don't know about all of this, and say tomorrow I decide <coughs> I get this vision that I'm gonna open up me a food truck. So I just figure that since I can open up me a food truck, then I can just sell food. If I don't know that there's a law or there's a standard, so then I don't know. And then the next thing, what if say for an instance I got a license, but say Sunday morning I'm over on Bethel Street, and then the person that operates the food truck get a call from me to come over to my church Sunday evening. Will you all be in y'all office on Sunday evening to answer the call to say whether or not that person can notify you all that, well, the selling over here is slow, but this evening they're having a big deal at the church on Buncombe Road. And I'm going to move over there. So who will be the person that they will call or who will be on call for them to notify you, whether it's on Saturdays, whether it's on Sunday? How will they know? Who will they call? And I know I threw a lot of stuff at you. Maybe you can answer. Yeah, are you ready for me to answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first thing, uh, once we get an ordinance enacted, then we can spread the information of the requirements of the ordinance. We don't have anything that we really have in place. Uh, we were advised at one point that Chapter 42 and the UDC were in conflict. So we have not uh, put out any information until we could uh, bring the, uh, the provisions of those two sections of the ordinance together. Once we get that done, then we will, uh, through all of the means uh, that are available to us, get the information out that the city of Shreveport has a food truck, food trailer ordinance that's in place, and these are the requirements that are associated with that ordinance. Uh, in reference to your Sunday evening uh, call, uh, probably nobody, I'm almost certain that nobody would be in the office to call, but uh, on, as with most things, in the event that someone wants to move, they can notify us first thing Monday morning if you allow that process to remain in the ordinance. Okay, so you say you all don't have any information. I don't know if you know about this. I just got this, and it has all of the guidelines on it. So can we? These are proposed guidelines. Yes. Yeah, so yes. can 
So as we propose, do you think we can kind of put this out to the general public to say this is what we're proposing? Like, for instance, we got legislation up now that says about sagging pants. Before we do whatever, because me, I'm satisfied with the whole deal except for I got to call you when I move my truck because, like yeah. I say, if I move, if I got to call, if I don't have to call you until Monday, then why not just wait until Friday, wait until next week? But just like we have this, I think this ought to be given to the general public or the folk that are concerned about a food truck to say these are some things that we are proposing to do. Let them have some input. Let them say, well this will be bad on my business if I have to do this. And then once we talk to those people, then we can come up with something that we can live with, they can live with, and they can make some money and help the city to make some tax money so that we can get out of the jam that we're in. That would be my proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that was not a question. Would you like, an, would you like a response? If it's to notify the people and bring them in, and, and we, we, we conducted the MPC, as you well know, uh, any time that the MPC board is proposing legislation to the uh, council, we conduct a public hearing. We go through notifications to uh, let uh, everyone uh, know that these proposals are coming before the MPC. Uh, and, uh, but if you are desiring us to go even further, we are more than willing to to do whatever is necessary to get the word out. Uh, we just need to know what we are about to happen. Or if you're going to, whatever you do today, we will go forth from that point. What, what I'm saying is I'd just like to get the word out to these people that if you have not registered your truck, then you're operating illegally. We can do that. And then once they understand and know that, and then we say to them, this is how you will have to operate, then we go from there. Here again, I'm just against the calling every time I move my truck. And that's, I understand that. That's the only problem that I have. Yeah, we sort than, of support that, but uh, we respect uh, your Yes, sir. Too, and I sorry. appreciate it. Other than that, I'm good with it. everything else. It's just a matter of notifying them that you're operating illegally. We need your tax money so we can... Um, get out of debt. Mr. Chairman, I, don't think that um, I just, we've said this before, but I want to be sure that the council understands this. We cannot amend this ordinance <clears throat> the way we would amend a budget ordinance right. or other ordinances of the city. This UDC text amendment, uh, the only way we can, the only thing you can do is you can approve it, you can approve it with modifications, or, or you can uh, deny it. Uh, the whole thing. But you can send it back to the MPC and ask them to reconsider it. So if you don't like any part of this ordinance, the only practical thing to do is to send it back to the MPC and ask them to reconsider it. So I just want to be sure that council members understand that you can't amend it the way we normally do. Ms. Clark, if we send this back to you, would you, uh, <laughs> would you all recalculate and, and help us out? I think if you send it back, from what I'm hearing, uh, Councilman Green, in all due respect, that we would start over with the ordinance. Uh, but more importantly, we would start over with getting the word out to the general public. Yes. That's part of what we're trying to do with the MPC, with, with the neighborhood and, and community planning initiatives, uh, better reach the, the different communities and neighborhoods around the city to advise them of these type things. And that's going to be helpful to do one of the things that you were talking about uh, is making sure we solicit the input from the entire holistically populated city of Shreveport and not just a small segment of persons that are submitting comments. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Clark. All right, Vice Chair Nicholson. Mr. Clark, I just want to make sure that I understand uh, the part of your presentation this afternoon indicating that we have more than 30 food trucks that are operating uh, without being registered. Are, are these food trucks 
simply not registered with the city's revenue division or are they not registered in any way and so they have had no health checks or other uh, safety checks? It is my understanding that they are not registered in any form or fashion, uh, Councilman Nicholson, and that uh, goes to uh, one point that was made by Councilman Green. That means that they are not paying any sales tax uh, to the city of Shreveport. Hmm. So they're not helping us get out of debt. Right. So therefore, but if we notify them right. that but now you, you got to be, because here again, they may just have, have a lack of knowledge. They just don't know. And if you don't know, they said, what you don't know won't hurt. What you don't know can kill you and cause you a fine. Yes, sir. So if, therefore, if we notify them that uh, you need to be registered, and here again, like we got this beautiful copy today, just give it to them. Say, hey, y'all not registered, but this is what y'all need, and just notify them and let them know, and then we go from there. Understood, and I, sir. And I, I, I will say that I'm... I'm, of course, concerned about any business not paying its taxes, but I'm more concerned about the idea of dozens of unregulated food trucks serving food to members of the public without going through appropriate safety checks. And I understand that the MPC does not have enforcement authority, uh, but the administration certainly does, and so I would encourage uh, the administration to have uh, the appropriate person get the list of unregulated food trucks and take immediate action. I, and I don't, you know, if, if somebody uh, attempts to comply with the law and misses a step, perhaps uh, a series of escalating fines is appropriate. But if somebody is operating a food truck without attempting to do what they're supposed to do, in my view, that they should be shut down immediately until they come into compliance. So I, I hope that's the direction we will take. Thank you. Okay. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and Councilman Nicholson, that, that's the sentiment that we share, and that's why we have tried so hard to put the ordinance in place, get it adopted, so that we can work with the administration, work with the fire department, work with the police department, and have a bona fide uh, legal uh, ordinance that gives all of us the authority to do the things that are necessary to make uh, all food trucks in compliance. Well, I, I, the question is, and what about the, them setting up on the vacant parking lot? So it was a question. We talked about this in our yeah. meeting that, that another issue is not only are people with, without a license uh, operating these trucks, but also that they could be doing it against the property owner. I think that uh, Chairman Bowman mentioned the right aid over there in his district that they they set up there quite frequently and I've got an area in my district where they're setting up frequently so I think that that also was an issue and uh, as you well know uh, the they set up on weekends uh, at the Rite Aid on Pines Road uh, and so forth uh, but if we pull an ordinance together and uh, it is an enforceable ordinance uh, we can work very closely with Shreveport Police uh, to remedy some of those problems. But right now we have nothing, so we don't call anybody, we don't include anybody in the enforcement process. Okay. Councilman Bradford. Mr. Mr. Clark, give me your definition of a food truck. <sighs> it's uh, A food truck <laughs> is, is a van-like structure on four wheels that's that's uh, moved by a motor from place to place in simplicity. So trailer or? Trailer is pulled by a motorized. That's, that's a food truck as well. Yes. What about, what about private property? And I know Rite Aid and other vacant uh, uh, structures, but like, and my question is, is derived from the mayor because we I was at a big event uh, this weekend there was several trailers that was there on the fairground for instance is that do you would you regulate that property the fairgrounds I mean you know part of the fairgrounds is operate is owned by the, the fair commission and part is owned by the city street board up uh, they would be exempt and all hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that. Yeah. Because, you know, when the fair comes, they're going to have their own yeah. food trucks. Uh, and I, and I'm going to sort of concur that maybe you need to look at this again. In regards to liability, if somebody gets sick, Councilman Nickerson he alluded to, is, was that was there a liability to fall on the city? Even at, even at the back of the one of these one of these one of these uh, the cattle uh, department of health is responsible for uh, issuing the sanitary requirements for food preparation and so forth. Uh, that is again the reason that we are working to pull together a comprehensive ordinance that would be inclusive of all of these persons because you would not be able to get a temporary use permit if you did not have a cattle parish health permit. Mm -hmm. uh, you would not be able to get a temporary use permit if you did not have an occupational license. Uh, you would not be able to get a use temporary use permit if you were not registered with the cattle parish sales use tax office. That's the only reason that we are trying to enact a comprehensive food truck ordinance to ensure that all of these things are addressed. And they, they, they have been addressed in the past. I've been around for a little while. Uh, and uh, at one point, the sales use tax commission pulled all of the uh, different entities of parish and uh, city government together and we united in regulating itinerary vendors, making sure that they had all of the things that we're talking about, and it worked. Okay. Now, I, I, I applaud the efforts, and I think we've got to get a, get a handle on it because, as I appreciate it, it appears that the, the food trucks and those type of vendors are increasing all the time, all over. So uh, I think there's a lot of areas that we hadn't even considered that need to be put into the... Uh, into the equation of when we start to talk about regulating these uh, these vehicles and these uh, establishments. And whatever you do today, we will go back and do everything that's necessary in order to get this back to you to be enacted into law. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Councilman Flair. Councilman Bradford. Yes. Uh, those hot tamales sold out of the back end of the trunk of a car, is that, did he say that was a food vendor? Uh, he said it was on four wheels, I guess. So. I said a truck, though. I didn't say on the, well, say the, the, the trunk of your car. And could we think about, because uh, some of the best brisket barbecue has been up on David Rains, I, I'd hate to think that they were illegal, but if they had some kind of sticker, you know, that would identify that they had complied, uh, would be a good thought when we go to talk. Yeah, I, I would talk. think the same thing. Like for instance, your inspection sticker. If a sticker was on the on the on the on the on the the truck or the vehicle, identifying them as as legitimate. Yeah, that's your temporary use permit. That's what that would be. And I guess we just have to to decide. Uh, it gets back to uh, Councilman Green's uh, problem. Uh, temporary use permits generally could be considered as site specific. And if they don't have to register every time they move to a different site, then that will not be a site-specific uh, temporary use permit. Okay. But as I said, we will look Mr. Chair, in depth. Could you come up with a use permit that's not temporary? I don't think you would want to make a, a mobile unit a permanent use because they move around. Mobile use permit. A mobile use is a temporary use because mobiles generally move around. As, as, as I said, we if you're not comfortable with this, we're 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 in the business of uh, providing recommendations that benefit the entire city, and we will do the necessary research and whatever is required to bring something before the MPC board and the city council, that's that's adoptable. Okay. Is it Councilman Fleur? Yes. Sir. All right. Councilman Green. Yes, sir. Ms. Ms. Clark, uh, I have forgotten my question, but when you called my name, it, I thought about it again. <laughs> you know, my youth is getting ready to go to Galveston on a trip, and they're going to be doing plate lunches, and uh, I'm going to be hauling them in my truck, and I'm a law-abiding citizen. I don't 
Would that be breaking the rule if if if, uh, if I put all them plates and deliver them in my truck? Uh, I think once you leave the city limits of Freeport, we have no jurisdiction <laughs> or authority. No, I'm gonna be in the city. I'm gonna be in the city. Uh, but I'm just asking because we do plate lunches at my over at uh, the chairman's church. They Rick's. They don't do no plate lunch, but we do plate lunch, and I have to deliver them as the pastor. I don't want to make the rule. So if you could just help us out. With I just this. don't want to make every church uh, at the city of Shreveport mad standing here. So. Uh. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Clark. I appreciate it. <laughs> I thank you, Mr. Clark. I'm good. Is that all, Mr. Chair? Thank, thank you, Mr. Clark. Is thank it. You. I'll just check with Councilman Green and see what they're selling. Um. <laughs> Did we... Um, I know we where we at now, but do we need to get uh, Mr. Eubanks to come up now? Is that okay? Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Councilman Nicholson. Uh, Mr. Eubanks, thank you for being here this afternoon. As I indicated to the administration previously, uh, I understand that the fair share program currently requires an on-site certification interview before certifying that an applying business is eligible for participation in the fair share program. Is that right? Correct. Uh, the fact sheet associated with this proposed ordinance indicates that perhaps that rule is not being followed in practice. Is that also true? I can't speak to if it's being followed or not because that's prior to my taking this capacity. But the way I see it going forward, in 2019, you can have an effective business without requiring a site. So, I mean, essentially. Well, I, I, firstly, I want to understand whether you as the, you're the director of fair share for the city. Yes, sir. Whether you are aware that, that uh, the city is presently disregarding an existing ordinance and certifying fair share businesses. I haven't certified anyone yet. I've been, hold, been holding all the certifications for this. So, so there have been no certifications since you took over in your new position? Not that I can think of. Uh, do you know why the fact sheet accompanying the ordinance indicates that uh, the ordinance has been disregarded in the past? And, and I'm specifically referencing the fact sheet's statement to the effect uh, that the ordinance needs to be amended to omit the certification on-site visit requirement uh, because uh, we need to bring it into line with actual administrative practices. No, and, sir. And, and, and I mean, your answer may be that it happened during the prior administration, and that's fine. I just want to understand. It might have, might have happened between, with the prior administration. Did you draft the fact sheet? Me and Karen Stray. Okay. Well, why did the two of you put that in there? Because, as it says for the requirements, that they can, if they're recertified, if I can't confirm that there were site visits, then I don't want to assume that there were. So, and then my, the second part of my inquiry relates to why this is a good idea. Just in the time that, uh, that we've been sitting here this afternoon, I have pulled up a copy of the State of Louisiana Department of Transportation Development's uh, Uniform Certification Program for Disadvantaged Business Entities. This is the, uh, the process that is followed for certifying disadvantaged business entities in hundreds of organizations throughout the state, well, excuse me, more than 100, may not be hundreds, uh, including the downtown airport in Shreveport uh, and our air, main airport uh, and the city of Shreveport. So DOTD work uh, to be certified as a disadvantaged business entity according to the document that I'm looking at. An on-site visit is required. Uh, all principal owners of the applicant firm have to be interviewed and uh, on-site reviews have to be described in a summary report. But I, I guess my, uh, my concern is we want to make sure that the fair share program is achieving its intended purpose of building minority capacity. Uh, and I am concerned about the idea of applicants not having to go through the process of an on-site visit to make sure that they are who they say they are, that the business is actually uh, owned by a qualified individual or individuals. Uh, and, uh, and that they are actually going to do the work. 
I mean, I, I will share with you one uh, specific abuse of the wait, fair wait, share. Before you go ahead, before you go forward, I don't mean to interrupt you. Let me correct you. You Please. said the, the program's objective is to help build minority capacity. The program's objective is to help build small business capacity. Okay, and, and I, I accept that. Correct. And let me draw another distinction as well. DOTD is for larger firms. So the firm, the, the actual net value of firms, when you're really looking at DOTD, or million dollar firms. When we're looking at the value of certi fair share certified uh, businesses, the firm value is smaller along the lines of $750,000. If you just look at the net worth of businesses, then it's likely to have a negative effect on a small businesses of that $750,000 or below net worth as opposed to a million dollar business. So, you know, it's, it's likely that if a business, a business is worth a million dollars, then they would, you know, effectively have a site visit. I mean, a, a it, home site. We are awarding multi-million dollar contracts to the fair share program, right? That does happen. Uh, it, it's possible, but... Does it not? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy so, to be corrected no, I mean, if I'm mistaken. No, I mean, there is, what's come across my desk, the largest, I mean, 100% pure contract. I mean, there's subcontractors on a lot of bigger contracts, but there has been no 100% pure uh, DBE contract that's been over, like, maybe $50,000 or something. Yeah. Uh, we are awarding multi-million dollar contracts to firms that are involved in the fair share program, or is that not true? Yeah, that, that's that, that Yeah, you true. can say that. Okay. So, hey, the fair share program and, and the, the status it confers on disadvantaged businesses is, is a substantial benefit. I mean, that's, it, it is beneficial to an applicant to be certified and to be qualified as fair share eligible, right? Exactly. I mean, that helps you, that helps you get business with the city that you might not otherwise get, right? Exactly. Okay, so uh, my concern is that eliminating the requirement of an on-site visit is inconsistent uh, with our collective goal of making sure that the program is benefiting the, the persons and the entities we intended to benefit. And now I want to uh, share with you a specific abuse that was described to me during the course of my campaign. Uh, I was told uh, that there have been occasions in the past, and I don't, I'm not aware that this has happened during the present administration, I'm not suggesting that it has, uh, where a, a shell company would be qualified uh, as a DBE, uh, would be awarded a contract, would have no equipment and no employees, and would do no work, and then would sub that contract out and take, say, 20% off the top. Uh, I don't have specific evidence of that happening, but that is the kind of abuse uh, that I think on-site visits would help us <coughs> avoid, and so I, that is why I raised the question today. Thank you. I mean, you raise legitimate issues, but realistically, on-site visits do, realistically, they, they do nothing but add, uh, cause damage to smaller businesses. Let's say they prefer, it's a company that provides a service. What happens if it's a painting company or it's a lawn service or it's even a cleaning service? You don't need an effective a site to run an effective company that provides those services. So as you repeated, I mean, as you stated earlier, it's the objective of the um, program is to help small businesses. So do we want to add those extra restrictions and add, um, add those extra restrictions and prevent individuals who provide those type of services because I could have a cleaning service work out of my home. I could also provide a painting service or I could even have a, a truck hauling service, have one hauling truck. Do, 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 does that require me to have a site visit? No, because I'm providing out services. So I think it, this actual um, requirement hurts more small businesses than it helps. And on top of that, just because we're modifying it, saying that mandatory site visits won't be required for everyone doesn't mean that site visits won't be required. That's why in the revision, it's saying that site visits may, may be required. That way we can address your issue as well as not call, have an adverse effect on other businesses. Okay. Councilwoman Fuller? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Eubanks, I appreciate that last statement you made that while we're saying they won't be mandatory, they may still be a part of this. Um, because I'm curious about 
what records you used to make your assessment that this wasn't something that was being done prior to your taking the office? Like, are there, are there no, you were left no records of pre, the previous, of your predecessor doing site visits? Because I went to a few different presentations where one of the things that was brought up was that if your office is your house, I'm not worried about the rest of your house. You just make sure that your office is clean because I'm coming to see where you're doing your work. Because even if it's your house, that is your site. I have some records, but again, I don't re want to rely on my predecessor's work oh, because I can't verify whether that is, in fact, a site visit or whether that, in fact, was a picture of I don't know what. Well, so. I would, well that says a lot because when we talk about records in the public, those are public records, and I should be able to do a PRR right now right. to pull anything but that came I'll, up if, in the if, last if, several years, if, depending if, on the retention schedule. And I agree, but if, again, if I representing this administration am held liable for it, then I want to be held liable and accountable for work that I've provided. That way I can stand behind it confidently. Councilwoman Fuller, can I, can I interject really quick? I, I agree with you 100%, and that is actually a huge problem with the transitioning of government here. That was one of the reasons why you know we put in place transition teams. There is no forcing function whatsoever from the previous administration okay. to give us any documentation. That's the important part You can right literally there. burn documents before the new administration walks in, and we can't do anything about it. That's what I was wondering yeah. about. I appreciate that, yeah. Mayor. Um, because you're right, if you, can't, if you don't have anything you can make that assessment from, then we're starting over from scratch. Okay. But can you just tell me why you feel more comfortable moving forward with a possible site visit rather than a consistent mandatory site visit? Is it just a matter of time constraints? It, it would be a time constraint. On top of that, there, are, there is no quantifiable, quantifiable figure when an entity comes and gets a packet or they download a packet. Small businesses already have enough hurdles. And realistically, we, we can't measure who's on the brink of quitting. If they've already been through enough hurdles, they had to pay Secretary of State to get their company's name, and they had to pay for an occupation license, and then they get the packet already discouraged or may not. And read, OK, I have to have a mandatory site. There is no quantifiable number we have that exists to say how many say, took the packet, saw they, that they had to have a site, and just threw it away. Tell me this, Mr. Eubanks, and I'm going to leave you alone so you can get to our ice cream, because that's important. <laughs> I don't want these folks sitting there with their check and we didn't spend any money, right? Right. With their truck out there. Um, is there another fail-safe within your policies that keeps us from dropping people through the cracks that might be in violation? Absolutely. One, you notarize, there is a statement on the first, a sworn statement on the first page that you notarize to, and swear that everything in the, that you state is true. So that alone gives us authority to actually penalize anyone who isn't being transparent. Second, you, you have to list, give a list of your work that you've completed, all those contacts, as well as list your equipment. From there, if, whether you're, if you're prime, obviously when you, pr when you submit a proposal, you have to list all your equipment in there and work completed again. And if you're a sub, when you're called to get a quote, they ask you what equipment you have there as well. So you get paid upon service being rendered. So if you can't complete the service, it, it, it serves no benefit because you're not going to get advanced payment anyway. Okay, I'm appreciating everything you're saying. Thank you very much. Thanks for being patient with me about no this because I have I'm, there's two issues for me. One is making sure that we do have the transparency Absolutely. and that we it, but to the point of not just transparency for transparency's sake, but to be able to say. We are showing you where the quantifiables are okay. in toward getting more minority contracts that are valid using these programs. Even though, yes, our part, that what your onus is is to build small business capacity. Quite a bit of that is for minorities. We want to make sure that we're doing the, we're doing right by that. The other part is, if we're going to talk about government overreach and cumbersome redundancies on something like a food truck, then we don't need to necessarily have redundancies here either. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilman Booth. Just real quick, uh, Ms. Banks, thanks for answering all these questions. It's been extremely helpful for me at least. Um, how many companies do, do we have right now on, on this list? 673. So it would be very problematic for you to go back and verify that that data is actually correct. Absolutely. Um, the only thing that I disagree with just a little bit, and, and not with you by any means, is uh, 
there are several different type of consulting firms and um, real estate firms, things like that, that do business out of their home. And uh, I think that that could be, I don't ever want us to, <clears throat> to hold the hands of somebody back from being able to do business in a timely manner. But I would like to know that these people actually do have a, an office in place to eliminate the problems that we were hearing. I heard the same thing that Councilman Nicholson heard on the campaign trail, that there were shell companies that were set up. And for me, that maybe that extra step, I don't know if we need to go back to 600 and some odd and do it, but maybe going forward, a site visit may not be a bad idea. Um, so that's just that's that's my take on it. I just want to say that if you're doing business in the city of Shreveport, you can have a home office and still be a legitimate business. Okay. All right. Councilman Green on the same subject. Yes, sir. Councilman Green. Um, we normally do this. How does Bolger handle layers? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, maybe you can't answer. I'm, I'm, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eubanks. You've been extremely helpful, sir. Thank you. Thank all. you. all right. Mr. Thompson, do we have any table legislation to be removed? Now that I know of, Mr. Chairman. All right. No property standards appeal to be considered today. No, no other appeals, Mr. Thompson? No, no other appeals. All right. Are there any uh, reports from officers, boards, or committee? All right, seeing none. Mr. Thompson, clerk report. Uh, I didn't look. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, Mr. Chair. Okay. I got one thing. All right, well, let's do it. I got Councilman. Bradford and then Councilman Bush. I was going to get Council. Anyway, Mr. Chairman, uh, administration, can you can you give us some clarity on on this water change policy that we keep hearing, or is is how, how is that how is that being implemented? Uh, well, Councilman, I will pass it over to CAO to address this question. But let me assure you, the uh, you know the. The word that th we would stop granting extensions past June 1st or July 1st or whatever, complete miscommunication. That's not the case at all. Um, you know, before we did it by, uh, you know, case by case basis, and that policy will continue. It's been nothing that was written down that told us that, hey, you grant extensions, you know, in this case or this case. So we're just doing it case by case. So the chain, the the word on the street about never grand extensions is that's not the case. That's not that's accurate at all. So I, I'll let the CAO talk in more detail, but I wanted to put that out first. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Yes, that's correct. Um, as the Mayor mentioned, there's nothing in writing that provides for extensions, but is it, it is a courtesy that the Water Tour Department has been providing to citizens for the disconnect notices, and that will continue. All right, good. I mean, I, I just want the public to be very enlightened on, on that situation, that they will have opportunities to make their case for extensions. Yes, sir. Now, Chief, uh, Police Chief, I'm getting some calls and I'm sure everybody, the other councilors as well, with the spike in, spike in crime, especially uh, uh, violent crimes. Can you, can you, is there any proactive measures that you're taking to try to decrease this, 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 uh, this situation? Certainly. Well, and, and a couple of things, if I may. We always have an increase in crime during the summer months. Okay. Uh, so we, we, you, call, you can certainly call it a spike, but we have it every year. We are still below last year's violent crime numbers at this time, uh, substantially so, 20 to 25 percent below. Um, now that doesn't mean all is well, you know, smooth, smooth sailing. Uh, we have spelled several special operations we've been running. In addition to the supplemental patrol program, we have assigned those officers uh, that work in schools, SRO, DARE programs are now working patrol at least two to three days of the week in addition to other duties they have during the summer. 
we've got special operations running through the weekend, um, one on Saturday and one on Sunday to, uh, to increase the proactive patrolling efforts, areas where we've had um, large numbers of people gather, for example, Ford Park. Mm -hmm. Last couple of weekends we've had incidents out there, so we have officers being hired back uh, to supplement our patrol numbers specific to those locations. Um, and we're always open to if, uh, if we need to increase those numbers or increase the number of operations. But we're, we're paying special attention uh, to those increases in crime, especially violent crime this time of year. And, and as well as those hot spots that you just mentioned. Correct. Yes, sir. So we got, we got an email uh, regarding, regarding Fort Park. Yeah. Are you looking at... Per, per, we, we're, we're hiring back uh, additional resources specifically for Ford Park. Uh, we, we, we run what is known as what we've always called the cruising operation now, historically, over a decade that I, that I can remember. Uh, on Sundays, starting around spring break, generally through early summer, you have a group of, of uh, individuals, generally younger uh, adults, older um, teenagers, that, that cruise around in their vehicles, play loud music, which in and of itself is, is, is fine. But uh, unfortunately, it does lead to increased uh, violence in some cases. You have fights, shootings. Um, a lot of traffic complaints, et cetera. So we've always had a, a contingency of officers working overtime on Sunday evenings, uh, focusing their efforts on what we call the cruisers. Ford Park, Greenwood, Juella, uh, Clyde Fan Parkway, the Raceway on Hearn. There's about six locations that we know that you, you move this large group. When I say a large group, several hundred vehicles, possibly up to 1,000 people, and they'll go from one particular area and kind of move somewhere else. And so we, we try to um, warn when possible, ticket if needed, uh, impound cars that, that meet the requirements for no insurance and multiple traffic violations, things like that. For whatever reason, this summer, um, that has mainly, we've mainly been having problems at Ford Park. And the other areas have not been so much of a concern. So we're going to take the officers that have been uh, looking at all those locations and, and have them assigned basically to Ford Park until we can, uh, get some calmness about it. Okay. I appreciate that, and I trust that uh, we'll see some, some re, you know, re response to, to your efforts. Mm -hmm. The incident that happened downtown Saturday night, uh, you, I know you can't come in on a lot, but have that um, suspect been found? At the, at the bar? Yes. No, sir. Um, I was given a briefing shortly before coming here. Uh, they do have, the detective worked all night on and all day. They've got some some good leads, but arrests have not been made. Okay. Is there any preventive measures you can take in regards to a situation like that? I mean, there is downtown patrolling already, I'm, I'm sure. There are downtown patrol, and this, this does not appear to be a case of, um, it was not a, does not appear to be a random violence. Okay. So there was, there was an incident that, that possibly occurred that led to this violence. It wasn't, it wasn't someone just walked out of the bar and was shot. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chief. Yes, Thank you, Chief Ryan. Uh Councilman Butcher. Just real quick, um, we, we talk a lot about water and sewage and, and the issues that we have in that department. I want to thank the mayor's office and uh, Ms. Featherston for over the weekend there was a uh, large sewer main that, that ruptured uh, behind a largely populated area in my district. Um, and I think that, uh, that there was a, a young man that found it because it was somewhat isolated from what I've been told. And uh, I think that the mayor's office and uh, Ms. Featherston and, and, and her crew and some contractors worked around the clock to get that taken care of. And uh, I think sometimes we forget how much we're dependent upon uh, departments like this in the city. But whenever you have a, an emergency like this, which really was an environmental emergency, and it happens all over the city, I, I just want to tell her thank you for uh, for getting this taken care of in a, in a quick manner. and. Uh, and hopefully uh, with our aging infrastructure, this bond uh, committee will be able to uh, maybe take care of some of these issues. So, thank Council you. Councilman Boucher, let me respond to you really quick about the, and I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, we had a staff meeting this morning um, where uh, Ms. Featherston brought up the fact that we are spending a significant amount of money this year because of the weather. Um, yeah. What was the, Barbara, can you come up for a moment? 
What was the figure? Was it two hundred million? We're expected to spend unexpected or two million, three million? I don't. I've added way too many zeros. Not Sorry. 200. Not two hundred. It went two hundred. A lot of numbers. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of money. Well, a lot of money. Of so before she gives that figure, though, what I want to what I want to emphasize is this year we got a year's worth of rain in about the first four months of this year. Uh, it's shifting our ground a lot. So pipes that are actually pretty new and in perfect shape are bursting because of the shifts in in our in our soil, uh, and it's ballooning. Uh, costs. What we're doing from the mayor's office, we've wrote, written notes to our legislators encouraging them that we need state and federal assistance. If we get a letter from council at your next infrastructure committee meeting, um, you know, with y'all encouraging the same, I'm going to reach out to the Cattle Commission. But these are problems that cannot be financially handled at the municipal level, and we need as much help as we can get. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but yeah, she, she can expound on it. But this is an issue that we need help with pretty quickly. Um, we, you know, in the past six to eight months, um, again, some of it rain-related and some just aging infrastructure, just on emergency repairs, some of which will be brought to, before council for ratification because they're not complete yet. Stoner is one. This Wallace Force Main is another. Um, a big hole on Kingston and Williamson Way, our 68th and Union pump station. You know, all of those are going to total two to three million dollars in just repairs that you know we had to get a contractor out within 30 minutes and start working um, we just I'm um, just this afternoon we're starting to we made the final repairs on that force main this morning um, it took staff I've had some staff that were out for more than 24 hours at a time um, trying to make sure that that was done we had other things because of the way sewer moves around the city, we had another break on another force main that we're actively working as well. And so everything just sort of, you know, has been an issue. It's, it's getting worse. Um, the, the stoner lift station where we have, we're bypassing um, currently right now um, because that pipe, which is in decent condition, just shifted because of being so close to a river that's out of its banks. Yeah. Um, you know, we're experiencing a lot of that. The pipe, the force main that broke, the Wallace force main that broke was in perfect condition, but it was situated near Bayou where there was bank erosion. And so you lost support from around that pipe. And so under pressure, it moved, it shifted, and it caused that issue. And, and we're seeing more and more of that with these saturated soils around the city. Um, we have a lot of river sand that runs you know, in the areas closer to the river, and it, it is causing a lot of issues. It's hard to, you know, I can't even fix the problem at Stoner Lift Station until the river gets down to at least 20 feet. So I've got eight more feet to go, and it's not looking like that's going to happen anytime soon. And Barbara, can you quickly talk about the financial structure of this? The two and three million dollars is all unexpected costs, and that's us actually planning for uh, emergencies. So it's going to go two, three million beyond the current budget. So we're we're, we're taken from our capital budget, and I'm stealing your we, thunder, I apologize. <laughs> we, um, because, because of the way we look, use, you know, revenue bonds, um, paying for that directly out of cash, out of our operating, will reduce what we can bond in the future. And so we're taking that out of um, capital that is being set aside for consent decree or water distribution projects. And so it all takes a toll financially on us. Um, it, it, it's... It's just been, I've been with the city for 12 years now, and when I was with engineering and now with water and sewer, we've always had, you know, things happen. But the magnitude and the frequency seem to be just getting a little bit worse. Okay. All right. I uh, erase Councilman Fleury, and then okay. I have Councilman Green. You, you done? I'm okay. Okay. Ms. Ms. Phelps, I'm sorry. Yeah, before you go. Is that Councilman Green is up now? He yeah, yeah, yeah. Councilman Green is up. Four. I wanted to know, Mr. Mayor, is there a way that your uh, administration could reach out to this young man who uh, discovered this problem? Because from my understanding this morning, had it not been for him, we would have a much larger cost that we could honor him and do a resolution because he has saved the city 
thousands of dollars. Like you say, two hundred million. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And he saved us, you know, so some I, potential health uh, health right. risks. Is there a well, way so we yeah. could reach out to him we, and give we, him a, a day? Yeah, we can I reach just out. Think it's just that important. Yeah, we can reach out to the cops. They didn't give a name. They just. They just said a young man that was 12 that was fishing. Yeah. We can reach out to the constable who reached out to us to get his contact information, Councilman. So we'll do that. Yes, sir. And, and Thank Councilman you. Green, I appreciate that because a lot of times we don't know that we have an issue until someone reports it. And, yes. please, you know, you guys do a great job okay. of sending me stuff. You know, and if our citizens, we have, an, we have a 24-hour dispatch line at 673-7600 that anyone can call anytime to report this and it gets put into our system and you know we're able to you know mobilize forces and get things checked out and so it's important if you see it report it it, it really does help the way that i saw it was by a video that was posted by the 12 votes homeowners association that the constable had actually been out there and and was interviewing this this young man and uh, I had no, so immediately I emailed you, and within a matter of an hour, Mr. Riggs, the mayor, Ms. Jones, everybody had, was on top of it. So I, I just want to reiterate to the public, call us. I mean, there's plenty of us, the mayor's office, the Department of Water and Sewage, m me, email me, call me, because if, if we all mobilize together, we can get it done a lot quicker, because I think on the video it was well it, it's been going on for a couple of days, and we called, and there was a ticket or something, and you know immediately we, we got it taken care of. So I, I appreciate your work and the mayor's office work on this, and and I agree with with uh, with Councilman Green. We we should recognize this, this young man. Mm -hmm. All right, Councilman Brown. Yeah, Mr. Spencer, I, I got a text while I was here that there was a is there a breach? Are you aware of a breach in the my main lines around South Lake Shore, Willow Point, Willow Ridge area? Mm, a breach, not and that, that I'm water is, water, is, water, water is off for, for, for I'm not, I'm not aware of it. I don't, I get my staff um, send out emails to myself as well as the fire department when it's an eight inch main or larger because we have fire hydrants. So if it's not, I don't know that I've seen anything yet. Well, check on it because I got yeah. a, I, I got a text that the water was off around Willow, Willow Ridge area. Willow Ridge. Okay. Yes, sir. I'll check on okay. that and Ms. I'll let you know. Ms. Featherson, also yes, thank you so much. People on the uh, corner of Crosby and Mile Street, they really appreciate you all finding that leak. and, and Sometimes it's, it. it's people get a little frustrated, but again, with the weather, yes. it's hard to find a leak when the ground is already wet and saturated and water is running off and 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 we you know we we are able to to catch a lot more during the summer when it's a little more obvious um we don't want to just start digging things up and making things worse when there's really nothing there and and some and then there's a good portion of the city where we have a lot of natural springs and you know we get those calls yes. all the time yes ma'am well miss ruby small and all the folk over good there deal. So thank you very much oh you're welcome sir yes all right um i think that's it i just want to uh let everybody know that i yeah on Mr. Muhammad earlier. I did speak to him and several others about um, the public comment section. Uh, and I may be asking, I asked some already about um, your feelings toward an amendment um, to maybe add in more time to those who have a, uh, a subject or an agenda item, more than one agenda item that they want to speak to. I think that after coming, you know, you may leave work early. Um, trying to get downtown to find your parking spot and you get in here, you're frustrated and you got more than one thing you want to talk about or discuss, especially if it's an agenda item. Um, I, just, I just want you to know, just consider that I'm bring that up for an amendment on tomorrow. Mr. Chair, uh, Councilman Green. Before we go, I'd like to wish uh, Councilman uh, Willie Bradford's wife happy birthday today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and, Councilman. Uh, uh, Councilman Fleur is going to pay for the dinner wherever they go on. <laughs> well, thank you, Councilman Fleur. Chairman. 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 I, we, if several of us want to, uh, I think everybody pushing the button to recognize uh, my next door neighbor, uh, Mr. Jeff Epperson. So we want to say hello to you, Mr. Jeff. Yeah. Hello, hello. 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 Hello, hello
Tell us how much you miss us. <laughs> that was almost a see you. that Jeff. That was almost a Price is Right moment. Right I know. Right there. Come, come on down. Why not? Uh, it's nice to have to be at this stand without anything important to say. I will say that I have no pressure on if I do good or not. It's wonderful, um, but I am. Uh, uh, you know, glad to see y'all. I have been staying away because I didn't want to be that guy that graduates high school and goes to all the football games, you know, like let you guys get into it and get used to it. So, uh, but y'all, it's been really encouraging to hear y'all deliberating and talking about all of these issues, you know, even some of those things I remember working on, like the food trucks, you know, I mean, when we had to start working on that, that we didn't know where to start, you know, and we got something, had to be modified a little later, getting modified again. You know, practice makes perfect, and that's what the legislative process is about. It's great to see that happening. And I uh, want to uh, thank my councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Fuller, uh, for uh, organizing this ice cream social today. So we'll be out there uh, helping everybody enjoy it. And, uh, you know, in the summertime, we may have some additional challenges, but we also have a lot of great things to enjoy in Shreveport, and it's a happy day. So come join us for ice cream, and we'll get to say we hello. Still, what, what, was it, what was the time frame? Uh, just outside uh, just after the meeting. Yeah, after the meeting. Okay, 4.30 to 6.30. 6.30, I think, maybe. Oh, well, okay, we got time. Y'all yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hurry it up and you'll get the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Thank y'all again for the chance to say hello, and it's great to see y'all out here. Right. Right. Like we'll, we'll be asking you outside how, how, how you began to look so young after you left here, too. So. <laughs> 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 hello. I think, that's, uh, I think that's it. Nobody else has anything else that uh, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, <laughs> 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 I'm